What's up guys, it's Josh. I'm editing the video you're about to see right now. And I noticed that in the video we weren't exactly clear about the purpose of the video, so I'd like to spend a little bit of time to talk about that. The purpose of the video was to give a framework for new and experienced players to on to help them on deciding to what they are getting into when they pick a new hero. Um, in terms of the difficulty of the hero to pick up and how long it will take to master a hero. Certain heroes have a, you know, an easier start and a much, much steeper climb at the very end. And certain heroes take a thousand games to master. Other heroes, you can probably get the hang of it within, you know, 20, 30 games. And, you know, all the heroes have a little bit of a different curve. So this is just to... Um, let you guys know about what you're getting into to make sure you don't, you know, spend 60 games learning something that you're going to regret. And just to give you like a framework and some thoughts about each of the heroes and their difficulty curve. All right. Enjoy the video. Take care. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another video here. We've got Josh, Nathan, and William Bradshaw himself. Um, us four are going to be going over a little chart for you today. Josh is going to describe it here in just a second. But before we get into the video, I want to talk about just a couple of things. If you aren't subscribed to the channel, go ahead and subscribe to the channel, especially if you enjoy our content. We've got a lot more of this kind of stuff coming out with World Championship going on soon. Uh, we hope to bring you guys some videos that you're really going to enjoy and learn from. Mm -hmm. um, also, like the video if you enjoy the content. And uh, we have a Patreon that... Uh, uh, we can check out um, over on Discord or on patreon.com slash the card guys. We have a tournament for all of our patrons um, coming up this Sunday. Uh, Sunday, the date for that is the 30th um, at 4 o'clock. We're going to be streaming that. So if you guys want to check that out, we're going to be bringing in patrons to like cast on some of the matches and just having a good time in general. It's going to be a really good time. If you guys want any part of that, if you want to get in the next uh, Patreon tournament, um, go ahead and subscribe to the Patreon. We have many different levels to choose choose from if you have any questions about it just message any of us we'll be happy to help you can also join our discord for completely free um, and get access to the paid benefits later if that's what's something you decide you want to do so mm -hmm. uh, without further ado i'm going to let josh go ahead and talk about the chart we are about to make and uh, i think this is going to be a really interesting one yeah we're the the chart guys are back here and we were <laughs> kind of discussing on our way back from the battle hardened um you know just some video ideas and we we're kind of talking about how you know there was a a little bit of an influx of new players recently and we were also talking about whether we were talking about the world's metagame and like how likely it was that people were gonna adapt to the changes in the metagame and we were just talking about like this the speed of adaptation in the metagame and that brought us to the whole concept of hero mastery and hero proficiency and the whole difficulty of picking up a new class picking up a new hero and so the, the the concept came to my mind of in pokemon so when when i played pokemon when i was a kid i didn't know anything about this leveling groups but in in the uh, game of pokemon here's a example here different pokemon took a di varying amounts of experience points to reach the maximum level of 100 right so Pokemon like Pidgey leveled up really, really, really quickly. They were in the fast or maybe even the erratic uh, leveling group. Whereas other ones like Magikarp is notoriously one of the hardest Pokemon to level up is in the slow leveling group, right? And it didn't different... Just because you were in a different uh, leveling group did not necessarily mean that your Pokemon was weaker or stronger. It's just how much effort did it take to get to a strong level and similarly in fab different heroes take different amount of time so just because Phi is quicker to pick up than icelander does not mean that their power levels are really different right um so yeah we wanted to kind of go over that and so here's how we set up everything here so we listed out all 16 heroes that are currently available in classic constructed and eventually we're gonna because we love our tier list, we're going to put them kind of into like <laughs> rankings of easy, medium, hard, very hard. We'll kind of uh, play that by ear. But the proficiency level here, I listed out, you know, five or sorry, six different levels here. 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100%. And those basically correlate 
or they they represent how close you are to making the correct how, how what percentage of decisions do you make that would be the same as the best players in the world at that hero also yeah. the there there might be a, another definition that, that we kind of develop over time but that's roughly what i'm talking about what i mean by proficiency level is if the best player in the world is watching you and looking at your cards do they agree with your decisions in general and basically to what degree can you play the hero to its potential right and I think it's important to note that nobody plays any deck perfectly. That right. The word, per, the word perfect should not exist. Yes. yes. To to get to 100% efficiency may take many, many, many games. Anyways, we're, we're defining the the this whole area here by number of games to get to that point. Um, there, Of course, there are ways to level up quicker. You could actually just watch somebody play, and then you could kind of learn as well, right? But in general, this this represents roughly the time commitment it takes to get to X proficiency. And for each of these heroes, we're going to be talking about like kind of level up moments, the aha moment, um, especially for some of these, especially because we have experience with those. We could tell you what the aha moment was for us, and maybe that will help you guys, um, you know, level up quicker as well. Right. OK, so we're going to kind of break this down into two parts. We're going to. Because if we put all 16 heroes on the same chart, it's going to look really, really, really messy. Uh, so we're just going to do the WTR and ARC heroes first. And then we're going to do the uh, the Monarch, Tales of Aria, and, up, and uh, Uprising heroes uh, second. So let's just start with these eight here. Is there any one in particular? Normally we like to kind of do a kind of like pillars, kind of like maybe the easiest and the hardest. Uh, is there any hero here that kind of jumps out at us as a hero that you would recommend to a new player? Or a hero that you can grasp the concept of the hero pretty quickly. Um, if someone gave you a deck list, you could probably take this to a tournament within 20, 30 games or so and feel like you're doing decently with it. Reinar. Reinar, yeah, that's funny. Really? Yeah. Reinar is what I was thinking. Uh, yeah. I mean, Bravo and Katsu too. I, 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 I thought about Katsu, <laughs> but the one thing I want to note about Katsu that puts it in a different class other than like the easiest is his hero ability. His hero ability is much more complicated mm -hmm. than another hero ability. Mm -hmm. So like right. the actual like like you know banishing effect, like you have to know like the cards in your deck, know the combo lines, these sorts of things. So that, that actually makes Katsu just a tidbit more complicated than a deck like Ira, which is the perfect deck for a new player, yeah, just okay. because it literally just says give plus one to your second attack. Right. Okay, um, so so these three heroes are kind of jumping out as easier in terms of their leveling speed. Yeah, Bra Bravo okay. is probably a pretty darn good choice, too. All right, let's yeah, talk about Bravo first. Let's talk about Bravo first. So okay. what makes Bravo a fairly straightforward hero to pick up? And... What makes it kind of easy to get to like a, you know, eighty percent efficiency level? Um, I I would say I would say Bravo. The simple, you know, it's just a math problem. All that's all Bravo is usually. Yeah, um, you can it, you, there's there's not sequential attacks you have to line up. There's not you know there's not generally a lot of decision making. It's like what is the singular best attack in my hand? How can I spend my resources most efficiently? And I think that's about the brilliant thing about Bravo is it's mm. very it's very simplistic. It teaches you to think one turn ahead, like I'm gonna need resources with my seismic surge for the next turn. Very, very simple, just a math problem. Um, okay. and I think that's what makes him very easy. Okay. So let's let's start putting in some numbers here. Maybe uh how many games do you think it takes to get to roughly 80% efficiency? We'll say 80% efficiency is kind of the baseline for where you'd want to be to take it to a tournament. Let's just kind of um, use that as a baseline. Like, you, you'd you feel comfortable taking this to a pro quest or skirmish or whatever. 90% is maybe you'd feel... M I, I, guess, I guess it's a little bit... Uh, I think we need to define these numbers a little bit more clearly here, because sure. because the or the original definition I went with was like how many percent of the decisions. Some decisions impact the game more than other decisions, right? So I guess this okay. is like I I guess this is like the 
overall power level of the pilot is another way to look at this, right? Um, oh, right. So also, also confidence level, right? Yeah, yeah, and and like how how quickly you can play the game as well, right? I guess proficiency kind of encapsulates many different things, right? So yeah, mm -hmm. so let's let's just start putting in some numbers. We can adjust things as we go if we need to. Um, okay, so how many games do you think it would take to play Bravo comfortably to a skirmish or ProQuest? I was gonna say forty or so, thirty, forty. Mm -hmm. uh yeah yeah i mean i think the only thing that bravo is learning the fundamentals of pitch stacking mm -hmm. and um really hammering down those those mirror matches no pun intended um and i, th I think those are right where the big skill sets lie mm -hmm. um but if you're if you're you know is I would it, say that you could definitely get to 80 and 40 games. Is it fairly linear to get up there? Like, yes. Yeah. Okay. I would say so. Okay. So pretty straight shot. Okay. So you could level up Bravo pretty quickly, but how hard is it to get the last 20%? I would that say that comes like, with, uh, yeah. Learning the, yeah. It's very easy to see the big dominate attack and think like, I need to make this happen. And it's like, no, you need to block and swing the hammer. Yeah. And Bravo's that's where actually you really start to figure that out. Bravo's a more defensive deck, and generally it takes quite a bit of time to understand all of the matchups to get, you know, the all the defensive matchups where you want them to be. So I think getting the last, you know, 20% may take a while. Even even in the matchups that are like like say like Bravo versus like Fi or Bravo versus Briar, a matchup where you're blocking a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I think like the attacking obviously is the the linear part. That's the easier part. Yep. The blocking, like you're talking about, is the more complicated part. But it also comes down to like, I mean, points of da like it's one or two points of damage, and also like deck construction decisions and that mm -hmm. sorts of thing. And right. do you think you're going to get the second cycle in the deck, like preparing sure. for that on down the long way, like blocking, like because if guardians are, are historically. Mm -hmm. very punishing for changing their game style in the middle of the game right so like if if you're like i'm going to take 10 damage to hit him with a dominated crippling crush you're not fatiguing that game you, that that plan is done um yep. you, you know like you you can't just switch in the middle of the game right. and i think that's where like yeah like knowing the game ahead of time like yeah. understanding where your you role live. yeah that's, exactly that is the difficult part all right let's let's just nail down some numbers here 90 percent efficiency or 90% of the power level of the hero takes roughly how long? 100 games? Yeah. Sounds about right. Yeah. I think it yeah. scales quite high as you get towards the end of this, right? Like, I think it's yeah, kind of. Kind of yes. <laughs> yes. It's going to be very, very, very tough to get up here. Great point. And then to go the last 10%, how long oh, does it take I... you to be on Kale McCreeth's level? Uh, Five, well, 500 games, 1,000 well, games? Well, right well, like. Kale McCreeth is 120%, so he's, yeah, he's okay. off the charts. But, how, how long but yeah, to get to 100, I yeah. mean, it, I would say, like, what, 250 probably? Yeah, that sounds about right. I think uh, because the, yeah. at that point, the thing about Bravo, yep. yeah, the, the, hard, the, the final step to Bravo is knowing what every other deck is trying to do. Right. That's where you get the the most advantage in Bravo is when you know what everybody else is trying to do and you can yep. leverage your cards to play against that okay. in a, a proactive strategy. He, he's a toolbox hero. He's got like, yep. oh, th this attack shuts off this. This attack shuts off that. You just have to know how to build your deck to go straight for your particular meta and and just play those yep. cards accordingly. Like you said, he's okay. absolutely knowing what your opponent's doing. Okay, uh, that's, that's good. Uh, we kind of nailed down one hero. Uh, let's... Uh, is there any of these that jump out as probably the hardest here? Uh, Kano. Kano, for sure. Yeah, yeah it's, Kano, not, it's not even sure. a question. Not even close. Not even close. Okay, so I'm going to argue that to get to 70 or 80 is actually not hard. Uh, especially if you're an experienced player. We have to assume that you're... I, I guess we should assume that you are somewhat experienced at the game. So you... you kind of know what the heroes do but you don't you may not understand each particular matchup yet right right to execute the basic ragamuffins uh blazing aether combo mm -hmm. the the um 
I guess it actually depends on how much AB your opponent is running. Right. So, I, I think to get to a basic level where you can execute that fairly easily, or fairly fairly effectively, is actually not hard. But the, the 80, 90, and 100%, this is those tricky games where they start running Oasis, when you actually have to do pitch stacking and all that, and then... Uh, comboing off becomes much, 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 much harder. I would like to present a counter argument, mm -hmm. if you will. I, sure. I think it's the exact opposite in my in my my th my mind. Mm -hmm. I think that to get to fifty percent with Kano, you're going to need twenty or thirty games, mm -hmm. and I think that to get to seventy, eighty percent, you're going to need a hundred games, mm -hmm. and to get to a hundred percent, you're going to need a thousand games. Like I, I think that. I think K Kano scale is much like from the base floor up. It's I think oh. it, like with most heroes, getting to fifty, sixty percent for a good player is just picking up the deck. Like yep. if if you put Michael Hamilton and or you know one of the best players in the game, and you said, "Here's this brand new hero with all of these cards that he's never read before," he could play through a game of that at fifty percent. I can almost guarantee it, you know, like mm -hmm. within the first two or three games that he plays it after reading the cards. Yeah. With Kano, it's a bit more complex than that because mm -hmm. you have to realize which cards in your deck are important. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's also like a memory challenge because yeah. the way that it plays is very combo oriented. And so if you gave like a magic player a deck like Bravo and you said, hey, play Bravo. Yeah. They're going to read all the cards and they're going to be like, okay, I understand what's going on here. Three or four games in, they're probably, you know... I attack them with two get floating. Out. Right, and a card right. Hit. exactly, exactly. Yeah. Where if you gave them Kano, it might take them 20 or 30 games before they realized, oh, there's a combo here that I'm supposed right. to be setting up, you know? <laughs> like, it, like, and like, uh, what is Potion of Deja Vu? What, what does that even do? Like, how do I use that card? There's just a lot of non-intuitive things in Kano. Mm -hmm. And like, like I want to get rid of my blue to like, just look at the top of my deck. Like what, you know, like mm -hmm. there, there's just, I, I, I just would present the counter argument and I'm sure. happy to be wrong if, if mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's an, that. th okay. That's an, that's an interesting argument. Um, what does Nathan and will think about, uh, roughly yeah, I, I would like, is it, is it like exponential here to get up there? Yeah. yeah I would, I, like, like I was trying to say earlier, I, w I would, I would sum it up with one point. I've never played a deck before that I've forgotten whose turn it was. <laughs> And if, and if, and if, so obviously like there's so many things going on mm -hmm. that if you can actually do that, it, there's obviously a lot that's taking place there. So I, I, I agree with, with the numbers that are currently there and I would may I would even go as far to say that to get to hundred percent on Kano, I don't even think it's possible. Mm. I, I really don't think it, I think Al, if you were to ask Alexander Vore, mm -hmm. if he, which pro is probably undisputedly probably the best at that deck. Him and Sasha Markovich, I believe, are the two. Yeah, you know, if, if you were to them. ask them if they were playing it absolutely perfect every single time, they'd probably tell you no. Mm -hmm. oh, I guarantee. Yeah. I guarantee yeah. you, every single game, they're 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 learning like even yeah. more nuggets. Yeah. It's insane. I I've played against Alex before, where he was like, "Yeah, I should have done this different." You know, it's like, yeah. and, and and you can tell he he takes a lot of time and thought. He takes every game very very very. You know, he takes it in depth. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, it's. I agree completely. Okay. Uh, does this curve look roughly okay? Looks yeah. good to me. Okay. Uh, let's 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 go back to Ketsu here. Okay. Um. So. I guess the the difficulty in Ketsu is knowing how to get a big turn off. Um, mm -hmm. And generally that's going to involve the Surging Strike line. Um, and I guess there's several different styles of Ketsu. So that's also another thing that makes it a little bit more difficult. Sure. Mm -hmm. It may be, um, may, uh, uh, while I'm looking at this, and maybe we should change Bravo mm -hmm. to five games for 50%, and then Katsu 10 games for 50%. Sure, we can do that. Sure. And how many games to get to a moderate proficiency? Seems like it should be a little bit harder than Bravo, but not that maybe much 50? harder. Something like that. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that it, it it takes more games to get to 80% than Bravo, 
Mm -hmm. but it takes way less games to get to 100% than Bravo. Mm -hmm. So I would say that it would literally go down, or not down, but at a lower slope toward 100%. That's probably true. Yeah, yeah maybe. There, there's only so many situations that you get into as Ketsu, I think. Well, there's, I mean, that's just a symptom of playing an aggro deck. You're yeah. you're mainly playing half the game. Right. Okay, so something but, like... With the exception of... Something yeah, like something like that. Something yeah. like that. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um let's let's finish off Reinhar and then we'll move on to the kind of more middling heroes. What Ooh. makes Reinhar f I, I'm actually thinking I've I have a, a whenever I've played Reinhar, maybe I just have no natural talent for this hero, but I, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and I don't I feel think, like I could learn what I'm doing with this hero. I think he's very similar to Cut. Katsu and to mm -hmm. uh, kind of like and to Bravo, honestly, like as far as like the game um, taken, he's very similar to Bravo in the sense that like his end curve is probably going to be about the same because mm -hmm. he does play for a pitch that game um, in longer games sometimes and mm -hmm. he needs to know his role in games. Um, right. You can't always just go swing hammer, but like and do dumb stuff with you know mm -hmm. all of your good cards. Um, you do have to know how, like, I think. As far as his early game proficiency, um, I would stick him above Bravo's as far as early game proficiency because you do have to know, like, okay, if I block with this card, when I cast this card, it's going to make this card a card, and I have to remember to keep a six in my hand to discard to the, you know, random mm -hmm. uh, cost, but you keep two sixes or whatever, and, and you can take care of that, that right. whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's just a little bit more as far as, like, the early... Um, Right. So like yeah, like ten, fifteen, whatever. Something um, like that. And then yeah, something like that. And then but I think his, his later scaling is very similar to Bravo as far as like mastering the deck. Like it's gonna be a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. Right. So like two fifty ish. Okay. Seems yeah, but... seems about right. Okay. Uh I guess let's just round off WTR and talk about Dorinthia. Um This is a hero that the aha moment is when you realize you don't have to attack with every single hand that you get. I have said this many, many times. What does Josh say about Dorinthia? It's not an aggro deck. It's, it's not an aggro deck, because it is correct. A lot of people <laughs> are jamming Glistening Steel Blade and Iron Song Determination and praying that they draw them together. And, you know, just going room as fast as they can that is not correct so that to go to level up from like seven from 80 to 90 this is actually the biggest jump here this is the one that takes mm -hmm. the longest amount of time to realize if someone does <coughs> directly just tell you and it's it's very there's actually a big difference between the 80 and 90 percent i can actually tell pretty quickly where whether my opponent is playing it roughly correct or mostly correct um, after about five, six turns, I can actually tell where my opponent is, which there's actually a very, very steep jump here. Um, to get up here, I don't think is particularly hard, but to jump here is pretty hard. Um, and then to get to here, this is not too difficult, I would say, but there's a, there's a big jump here. So let's put some numbers here. Um... Guys, have any thoughts on Dory? No, you're the Dory master yeah, here. Yeah, that's, that's you. <laughs> okay. that's, that's all you. If anybody that's can you. speak, so, you learned it. So, to get it half right does not take very much time. No. You put your non-attack actions down, you have a blue, and then you play your attack reactions. Uh, so I don't think that... The, the beginning here is very similar to Bravo. It's not very hard. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a, quite a jump here, somewhere around here. Um, mm -hmm. This is where you start to learn to set up potions. You start to learn to try to bait out D reacts. This is when you start learning how to use your equipment properly. So this this is kind of a jump here. So this is maybe about a hundred or so, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, and most people that love Dorinthia have like somewhere between like a hundred and three hundred official games, roughly. But to but there's kind of a difference once you get to about. How many games did it take me to kind of realize this? Maybe like 250 or so, somewhere around there. To realize that um, 
because your cards are actually very fair and your cards actually rely on you hitting twice to get proper value, you actually have to set up such that um, you're, a, especially on your Courage of Bladehold turn, you have, now, nowadays, when I play Courage of Bladehold, my opponent should just know Josh is just going to hit me this turn. There's actually nothing I can do about it, generally. <laughs> uh, because I I set up it in a way such that generally it's with Steel Blade Supremacy, and generally I set up either Singing Steel Blade or Overpower or Twinning Blade or something like that, such that no matter how they defend, I can go over or go around and then execute a triple hit combo. Generally, I try, try to set up, a, set up a potion as well. So the amount of games it takes to kind of realize that and to you know finesse your your offense is is really the key and that takes quite a while uh to get to a hundred percent uh i don't think it's there's a huge difference between 90 and 100 um for dory um there's i i think most of the time when you look when like if two good dory players are kind of like looking at the game they would make roughly the same decisions but they may make different decisions on the macro sense on the micro sense they're probably going to make the same decisions but it's mm -hmm. mainly about like what was your general strategy and different dories have different decks so they have different uh, outcomes i don't think it's actually too hard to go from 90 to 100 on dory it's mainly just like shoring up your weaker matchups so maybe like 400 or so you can get there cool. it's not it's not the main jump is here um I would also say uh, with Dorinthia, it's one of the very few decks that you can get an artificial like feedback loop from your opponents that make you think you're playing the yeah. deck way better than you actually are. Yes, you know, because you could throw, it, you know, you could run into somebody that doesn't know how to block, and you can just smack the pants off of them, right? And then you're like, oh yeah, yeah I'm really good with this deck. Uh, yeah. Like when me and Josh first met at an RTN, it was a Dory Mirror. I thought I was at 80%, and he quickly showed me I was at 50 to 60 <laughs> and, and, and about four turns. And and then, um, yeah, so I think that's kind of like a Dorinthia exclusive as far as, you know, you're, if you play certain opponents, he can give you the um, yeah. the feeling that you're very proficient, but you're yeah. really not. I, I would the say. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I would say going that 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 reminds me of something. Going from uh, ninety to one hundred, this is actually where you learn to adapt your in-game play to your opponent's strength. So once I kind of understand my opponent's level, which actually is not directly correlated to their general level, it's their level against Dorinthia, right? Some pe some people might not be, you know, Pro Tour winning level, but they actually understand that matchup really, really, really well. And so I have to adapt to that, right? Basically, I warrior. I told Nathan like, you got to kind of know what you can get away with, and because mm -hmm. your deck is a little bit fair, so you have to kind of know where you can cut corners. Uh, yeah, you were gonna say something, Alex? Oh yeah, I was gonna say. Um, uh, honestly, like when I first started the game, Dorinthia was one of the like slightly more difficult <laughs> things for me to understand mm -hmm. because of the go again mechanic and how it works in the game. Where Dorinthia requires two different things for you to be able to swing with the Dawn Blade twice. It requires go again and for you to hit. And right. then Twinning Blade throws another Literally. whatever into the uh, yeah, whatever into the mix. And you're like, wait, what what do I like, you know, trying to comprehend that as like a newer player reading these cards for the first time. Mm -hmm. Um, I would argue that that makes it a little bit harder than like something like Bravo. So maybe like the fifty percent be a little bit higher but uh, honestly everything is very agreeable it's just that make that that combination of things makes it a little more complicated i i need to preface this that this stat line here is for dawn blade dorinthia i think it is much 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 easier to play axe dorinthia to its full potential which is uh, yeah, its you, full potential yeah. is lower than dawn blades <laughs> but it's much easier right. to get to that full potential right okay um because 50 that, games to get you there on axes and if you're already playing Dorinthia, like I literally played like I think two uh pro quests with like the two handed or one handed weapons and I already kinda knew like all yeah. the play patterns. I'm like, alright, I, I can play this, it's not too hard. Okay. 
Um, let's talk about <laughs> Dash. I feel like Dash is one of those heroes that rewards <laughs> fundamental play. And it's also a hero that uh, generally is built uh, as a Switch style. And because of that, it takes a little bit longer to learn both styles. And you have to know which matchups you want to play those into. Uh, the card pool is also, you know, there, there's a lot of... Uh, there's 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 lots of different builds that you can go with dash so i think there there's some um difficulty in mastering it but it's probably not super hard to get uh up to the efficiency i, I guess the curve is going to look pretty similar to dory's is there like an aha moment for dash somewhere in in the middle um Maybe not other than the fact that you like it's kind of like Bravo where you have to know what your role is, but mm -hmm. before sideboarding, you know, like uh, because they play kind of like that switch style, mm -hmm. um, you kind of need to know like, like, OK, if I bring in like all these D-Reacts, right, boosting is going to be a lot less efficient mm -hmm. or like, the, you know, things like that. I, I'm not sure if there's like a super aha moment, but it's more of like a like for me, because I actually I'm speaking from experience because I've played my first games with Dash actually in this past month. Um, it's more of like a realizing like, okay, which item do I need to start with in mm -hmm. every single match? And mm -hmm. like when to take a turn to just block and play another item. That's like a pretty important like decision point in the game that you need to learn. Like, okay, Teclo Core is really powerful in some matchups, right? Like... Um, but it, on the surface level, you're just like, oh, a couple extra resources. Like that's not that. But you don't realize like how much damage that that can uh, add up and mm -hmm. it blocks really efficiently. And I, I don't know. Like that's the kind of stuff I feel like that makes. Uh, yeah, the, for... yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. The the eighty percent mark. I would I would base it off of just knowing the mathematical fundamentals of the deck involving the items and your access to to energy resources and the maximizing those evolutions gets you to 80 and then like you know simple plays like back when aggro dash was all the was all the hype you could you could determine the level of your opponent very quickly the first time they played spark of genius and went and got a techo pounder instead of a spark of, uh, instead of a, a techo core mm -hmm. uh, because techo core is way better and they would get the Tekel Pounder because they saw the immediate face value instead of what the resources could be and didn't understand the math behind grabbing the core instead of the Pounder. And so I think that's what gets you to the 80% mark for sure. What do you think, Will? With Dash, a big thing is like getting to that point where you can get across that finish line without run running out of gas. I've beaten so many dashes because I've pivoted into fatigue last second, and mm -hmm. you shouldn't be able to do that. If I didn't start out blocking to fatigue and then I switched to it, I should lose, but I've mm -hmm. still managed to pull it off against a lot of dashes, and that's just them not using their, their numbers correctly, their resources. Yeah, yep. agree. I, I guess adapting to what you boost can also mm. change things. Mm. As well. Yes, that's something they. Knowing how many of. cards you have in your deck. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Knowing. Yeah. Okay, so we we think that the uh, you know the early stages looks roughly like Bravo. Uh, but yeah. How, the later stages is this harder than Bravo or about the same as Bravo? I'd say, say it's about. Go ahead. Oh really? About the same? Nah, no, no, no. I, I would say it's about the same, but I could be wrong. I, I would say harder. I would say about the same to a little bit more. Okay. So like, something like that. Is, that, is that what you were going to say, Will? Or I just like what Josh said there. It's like seeing what you banish and playing off yeah. of that. Because I've seen some people just banish a really important item and be like, ah, it's fine. I'm like, ah, it's not fine. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's really not fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so something something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I yeah. guess let's let's talk about Viscerai. We got we got some Viscerai players. Here. Oh goodness. I think this deck actually oh. takes uh, the, the first few steps is roughly as hard. Super easy. Oh, okay, what? now that there's only one way to play him, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. So oh, I guess yeah. Yeah, we're I'm talking about right now. Days. We're not yeah. we're not talking about the old days. We're talking yeah. about right now. Visra used okay. to be the ego deck, you know, that all well, I'll take that back. Kano's always been the ego big brain yeah. deck, you know. But Visra used to be 
it's the good. big brain good deck you know yeah. <laughs> and uh because there was a lot of things with the combo version that you had to learn to pivot and things like that but now mob shrill rosetta oh i got an extra card mob shrill <laughs> revel <laughs> rosetta <laughs> like <laughs> like that is literally 90 percent of your yeah, turns. Um, crazy, man. so i would say you could easily get to 80 percent in in 20 25 games like like literally i, I think you could mm -hmm. now going from 80 to 100 involves things like the if i can tell how good a Vistra player is if you just told me what turn it was and you let me look at the board mm -hmm. if you tell me it's turn four or five and they don't have a counter on creepers they are not playing Vistra correctly mm-hmm that's unless funny. unless they are playing against Oldham or trying to like beat a fatigue situation, mm -hmm. ninety percent of the time that is incorrect and they are not understanding the true potential of spellbound creepers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how you really level you know, of course, become the art knight gives you an aneurysm every time you draw <laughs> but because you know you can play just about anything in your deck and mm -hmm. but like once you play it a couple times, you start to like, okay. I mean, it's as simple as looking at your hand and look at what what you're missing. Do I have a mauve? Check. Do I have a blue? Well, obviously, because Become the Art Knight is a blue. And then do I have an attack? Do I need a better attack? You know, it's like, mm -hmm. it, that's just putting puzzle pieces together. But Creepers is the biggest. So I would say getting to, it starts real low, mm -hmm. but then takes quite a few games to get to 100%. I would say... It probably finishes where Dash is, mm -hmm. but starts out way lower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Creepers is, at, at least for me, when I first started playing this guy, <clears throat> sometimes it was like, this card blocks for one. And then eventually <laughs> you graduate and you realize, oh, this card's great. A shiny yeah. iron high, or iron rock boots. <laughs> <laughs> Some easy iron hot boots. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of bit, a lot of play to be had with spellbound creepers, and there's a lot of different ways you can use it. Yep. All right, uh, let's talk about Azalea. Azalea is easy. Azalea takes <laughs> like, in my opinion, it's well, I guess there's the the big fish uh, that she wears on her head, but it's just it's just dominating. <laughs> 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 no, I was I was at the Battle Harden um in in Columbus recently and I I I finished my match very quickly and I took the time to go to the um uh, and watch Levi play his Azalea deck that he obviously did real good with. He made top eight. That there were some turns where it was brain dead and it looked like Briar. Mm -hmm. Right? Pump, pump, big attack. Yeah. Right? And it's like dominated, but there were some turns where he was, he was flipping cards. I didn't know where they were coming from. I didn't know if it came from the top of his deck at the bottom of his deck. He was tapping a guy next to him on the shoulder and getting one of his cards. I didn't know what was happening at certain points. Um, but that also could just be associated with the fact that I've never, ever looked into that hero to play and i've never been exposed to it so that could be like he could be doing the easiest thing but it looks yeah. fancy it could be a it's, symptom of that it's the fishbowl that that will was talking about like right it, they've got a few cards that are like they're constantly playing with the top card of their deck and like doing things with it so like that's a that's something another uh, no other deck does um, right and so it does look a little bit fancier from, from that perspective but it's like a toned down Lexi, you know, yeah. like he, mm -hmm. you don't have all the elements and the frostbites and the flip and the, you know, all this kind of stuff. It's more of just like, I'm going to hit you with kind of like Bravo style cards. Like I'm going to have some on hit effect and it's going to be big. It's right. probably going to be dominated. Can you block it? Cause I can't block anything. So. Well, this, this, <laughs> this iteration is just remorseless and read it in the ledger dot deck. And when you have knock the death whistle, which puts an arrow on top of your deck, you know, you grab one of those. When you've got memorial ground, grab an arrow out of your grave graveyard and put it on top of your deck. You've got that. Like she's always going to have whatever arrow she wants on top of the deck. Yep. And then it's a matter of pumping it, shooting it, carry it on. 
Yep. Right. Like viscera, you know, you need the pump, you need the arrow, and you need a way to shoot it with some sort of like, like mm-hmm. I need like the blue or whatever, like so right. I can do all the things. Mm. Okay. Um, give me a number curve, roughly. Um, I think it's very similar to Bravo, honestly. Yeah, I'd say I'd say that's probably pretty accurate. Okay. And kudos um, to the guy for doing it. I just don't think she's that complicated. <laughs> Does that mean we need to revisit our Reinar numbers? Because we we were talking about it being the easiest. Yeah. I, I think we, we can are, 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 are we re, are we revising what we said? Well, I think Reinar's <laughs> easy at first. I think he's actually a little tricky. Just like I don't know. These, you gotta are these medium because they end medium. Right? Yeah, yeah. End they'll, in they'll a hard way. Medium. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, Dory is yeah, also yeah. medium, I guess. I yeah. think Dory could be maybe considered medium hard. Yeah. Okay. Sure. We can we can do that. Uh. Okay. Uh. Okay. So roughly, we're just using the same numbers as Bravo. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. Okay. So we got our WTR heroes, ARC heroes finished here. Um. In general, uh. If it's hard to learn, if it's hard to start, it's generally hard to finish. Uh, I guess some of the heroes that are the exception to that are Viscerai, where there's like a big jump in difficulty. Uh, I would also say Doria also has a pretty big jump in the middle as well. Um, yep. yep. Okay. So that is that. Uh, let's let's start over here, and we will put the data into here. Let's just. So what Let's you're telling ahead. me is in 3,000 games, I can learn every hero at 100% efficiency. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Let's see. 1,000 games, hour game. <laughs> yeah. What did what did they say about like 10,000 hours? 10,000 hours. Yeah, 10,000 hours. Next group. Yep. Okay. Uh, <sighs> is there any hero here that jumps out as being easy? I, I want to hear about Bolton first. That's what I want to hear about. I want to hear about Bolton first. Okay. I do. Uh, this hero is deceptively it 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 seems a lot easier than it is, and the reason mm-hmm. why it's so much harder than it is is when you face disruptive decks as sabers. You have to understand their card pool very, very, very well. And you also have to play, just like Dory, you have to play to their level. That's also really, really difficult. If you play Raiden against disruptive decks, you have to know how to execute a big turn through their disruption, which is also very difficult. Uh, Raiden also is not as intuitive to play because you... You're you're losing a card to your soul, right? So, the the power of your deck, uh, it, you're you're quite reliant actually on Lumina Ascension, Celestial Cataclysm, uh, those type of effects in Raiden, and that's something that people don't realize quickly. They're just like, oh, I have Bolt of Courage and I have a Courageous Steel Hand. I just play Bolt of Courage and I aha, I draw a card. <laughs> right? Well, you drew a random card and that may or may not be good, right? And oftentimes you don't need that card to swing Raid in anyways because it costs zero, right? So the real level up moment is learning how to execute a big V combo with them having disruption. Like one of the hardest matchups in the game for me to pilot is actually Raiden Bolton against Olden. That's a very, very, very difficult matchup. You have to play basically perfectly because they have Stalagmite, they have Ice React. Very, very, very difficult. Um, the So that makes Bolton actually much, much harder than it looks. In terms of against like non-disruptive decks. Against non-disruptive decks, you're pr- not playing Raiden, so I'm not going to talk about that. Just, if you're playing against non-disruptive decks as the Saber combo... You have to know how to defend against aggression, which is much harder than it looks. That's something I'm still learning. Like, how to defend against Fi's attack patterns is actually not as easy as it looks. Um, Partly because you don't actually know what they're going to end their combat chain with and whether or not they're going to, like, 
like one of the one of the fives I played in in Columbus actually got me with a CNC. Like I had to give him a card plus my armor because I didn't think he was going to run CNC. Right? I, I was like, most fives aren't running CNC, so that's very weird. That's a you you have to adapt your defense to what they're doing basically. So, uh, in terms of executing the combo, not hard. Uh, the, it's kind of just a math problem. You just see, okay, is there any possibility I get can fizzle? No. Okay, fine. Right. Post combo also fairly straightforward as well. You use take flight or via the vanguard or beacon of victory to push through damage. Right. Uh, but the main the main difficulty from playing Bolton actually comes against disruptive decks and when you have to play Raiden against disruptive decks. Um, those are really, 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 really hard. Actually, uh, that's something that. Uh, takes a very, very long time to understand because you're, you're playing both sides of the game and it's really utilizing... Um, you're using all the steps in the all the game phases and you're having to play early, mid, and late game and you just get into so many situations that are uh, not straightforward. Um, so anyways, so to play a Switch Bolton deck uh, actually is... Uh... Try to get like an average between like yeah. all of like the Bolton yeah. strategies. So, so the I, so the the level up moment here is gonna be a little bit. L it's it's actually gonna be a little bit later because the difference between it's actually gonna be around here ninety to one hundred. The the difference here is that you know how to play, uh, you know how to defend properly against aggro, which. Most people could do decently, but then to understand the possibilities of your opponent, that takes a little bit of experience. And same thing with the Raiden Bolton. Understanding how to play against each of the disruptive decks in the format requires quite a bit of experience. And that's the level up moment here, I would say. Uh, getting to 80 is actually not hard, but... Getting to 80 on a hero that's underpowered is actually doesn't cut it. So a lot of people give up once they get to about here because they kind of hit a brick wall. In order to get the most games to be within the realm of winnable, uh, you gotta play the deck near near 100, which is which basically requires you to know the defensive and offensive uh, stages of the game perfectly. Um, okay, so let's put some numbers here. Uh, Again, I don't think it's actually very difficult to learn the first stages of the game. Um, something like this. Um, but the last two is actually going to be the most difficult. I would probably put this at like 200 and like 600. Something like that. Something like this looks yeah. about right to me. Having played Bolton, like I felt pretty proficient with him back in the day, and like mm -hmm. I didn't even know the surface. I didn't even play a combo. I only did Raiden, but like right. it's very easy to understand. Like, ooh, this turn is going to go here, here, here. I'm going to be able to use my soul like this to get go again here, yeah. here. And it's just it's not too difficult. It's very fun. But like you said, after a certain point, you hit that wall, and you're just like, well, I can't get any better from here. Time to move on. You can. It's just going to take a lot of work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, to, to back up your point, um, how many Boltons were there at Pro Tour 1, Josh? Three. Three. And how Pro many of... Like, One. No, no, no. I mean, like, how many of those did well? Uh, I, As far as I know... Because you are one of I them. The, you did well. Other than US Nats 2022, I have been the highest placing Bolton in every single major event. So, exactly, and uh, and is there anybody in that room that has more Bolton matches under their belt than you do? Probably, probably not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, that just yeah. backs up, you know, your yeah. your six hundred match. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Playing the deck well, against oh. heroes that don't have disruption is actually fairly straightforward. It's when they start to disrupt you, you actually have to really use all the tools in your arsenal. Okay, yep. uh, so I'm gonna put him as hard not it's not not insanely hard but he's he's not easy to play okay uh leviah 
I wish we had a Leviathan player on the team to talk about this. Uh, I'm gonna that. I'm gonna make the argument that that is the hardest hero to play from good. the beginning to play. Yeah, so easy to kill yourself. Yeah, yeah. I think I think from the get go, alive yourself. I think that it's even like harder than Kano it, to play to pick up. Yeah, it it doesn't it doesn't cap out as high as Kano does, obviously, because mm -hmm. you know there's there's just simply not that many lines because you're only playing on your turn. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of like, you know, setting up your graveyard in a certain way, knowing when to go from that graveyard building stage to just throwing all your attacks at them and mm -hmm. stuff like that. There, there's a lot of um, you have to un you have to think several turns ahead, it's especially in terms of the life totals. If there's ever a point where you actually have to block with two cards you probably have lost the game because then mm -hmm. you're only returning a basic attack banishing cards to turn off blood debt and if that does not threaten cards from their hand you're in a lot of trouble because mm -hmm. so the Leviah's uh attacks are fairly face up in the late game if you're running out of cards you're basically like bravo what you see is what you get in the late game Bravo is generally not pummeling things in the really late game, right? He's generally sending something, and what you see is what you get. Same thing with Leviathan in the late game. What you see is what you get generally in the late game. Uh, where there's some ambiguity in what she's going to do to you is in the early to mid game. Uh, it's although it's not as threatening as like other heroes that have on hit effects. So defending against her is a little bit. It's easier in that she doesn't have on hit effects, but early game, they can attack you with like two, three, four things. Um, without yeah. too too much difficulty, I'd say also using the husk correctly is something that takes some time to learn. Um, it is, it's if you you if you use it too late, you lose it, right? If you use it too early and you not on the it. right thing, you've kind of wasted it, right? So, so this is a hero that requires you to understand how to defend while trying to maximize your your damage output. Um, okay, so how how far do we think it takes to kind of get towards this, or how long does, do we think it takes to get to this end point here? Um, I would probably, like, I would say it's probably similar to Bolton, but doesn't cap out as high. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Okay, yeah, like so the, the, er, the early to late, like mid-late area, maybe like 30, 40... 60, right, you know, like kind of, yeah, kind of yeah, yeah. mid around like the, mm -hmm. like at the very end, there's kind of like a little, <laughs> yeah, but it's, but it's not, but it's not as high as bolt, yeah, right. Okay, a little bit harder to pick up, uh, a little bit easier to master, sure. And, uh, and this, this is this, this is a great point to emphasize that mm -hmm. all should... decks at a hundred percent do not win the same amount of games. Right, so just because you can play Levy at 100 percent doesn't mean you'll win the same amount of games as a Oldham at 100 percent. Right? right, this yep, is yep, not yep. a power level oh. chart. This is a proficiency chart. Yeah, I still think Levy is a very bad hero, but she's a very Ooh. hard one to learn. <laughs> so I just wanted to, you know, like, and that's the reason not many people that. play her because co yeah. if you combine right. those two things, it's like, why would I want to spend all this time learning this hero that's not even going to win me all the games that I want to win? Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. But if you if it's your thing, more power to you. you know, oh, absolutely. Uh, hope you do good. Hope you do good. Absolutely. I mean, it just took down one of the best players in the world on stream recently. So, yep. right, you can do it. That's it. All right. Uh, let's move on to Tales of Aria. Uh, Moving on. Old Tim. Old Tim. Old Tim. Now, I guess this is the more complicated version of Bravo. But how much yeah. more complicated is it? Is the question. So I, I think one thing to import that's important that we talk about when we're talking about old him here is I think we should specifically focus on classic constructed with crown of seeds mm -hmm. um, because I think playing old him without crown of seeds and blitz is much more simplistic and much more Bravo esque. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas playing him with Crown of Seeds and CC is going to... I think that's... I don't know. I feel like that distinction should be made. I don't know if you guys agree or not. Sure. 
uh you you've played quite a bit of Ulden. was there like an aha moment for you when you playing that hero was it like yeah, oh you don't um, have to crown everything away type of thing or yeah and i think he kind of goes with playing starvo as well um it's kind of like that same kind of like play pattern that you're looking for but you just have this added element um one of the one of the things i will say about old him where it was kind of an aha moment to me was his hero ability um so his hero ability is a bit strange on the surface because you're like man i need a whole card it can do one of two effects your opponent has to play around both of those effects constantly so it makes just having that text on the hero makes your opponent play a certain way where they're pitching to have no cards in hand make sure they have all the resources on the board instead of in hand just because of that so like you can adapt your playstyle slightly because of that. And I'll never forget this because I went to a skirmish and I won the skirmish with Oldham in Blitz, activating his hero one time the entire tournament. Hmm. And um, I'll never forget that because I made it all the way to the finals until I was like Ice React and I was like, wait. I don't know if I've done, I haven't done this the rest of the tournament. You know, it's like, <laughs> like because I, I wasn't an Oldham player at the time. I just knew that Oldham was really good in Blitz. But to, to that just shows you the power level of him as well is like you don't have to be proficient completely with him to do well with him and that goes back to what nathan was saying this is not a power level chart this is a proficiency chart and i think that being proficient with old him is at a point is going to be like very very like curved towards the, the end whereas the end, right? yeah right where his power level of his cards and the simplicity of a lot of his cards is very easy to understand and right. play with in the very beginning stages right. but understanding like pitch stacking and using his ability you because you have crown of seeds you have his ability and you have like like um and, and you're pitching constantly so you have three different ways to put cards in the pitch zone um for pitch stacking purposes you can either hide one with crown of seeds you can pitch it blatantly or you can ice react or earth react right so there's a high like threshold towards like mastering the deck that involves a lot of like knowing every card in your deck how they interact late game how i'm going to get to the late game and actually get to those cards again and more importantly when you get to that stage in the game you needed to be at a high enough health total that you can actually keep those cards in your hand and like there's there's just a lot of little things to old him that that make make the difference you'll see a lot of old him matches one at one or two life you know like difference and if they hadn't blocked an arcane damage a certain way or they hadn't ramparted twice in the same turn at one point because they anticipated you know the chain breaking you know like there's just so many little things like that 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 can that can get you uh the victory later on but they take a lot of reps to realize like okay I need to use my stalagmite on this particular turn because I know the cards in my opponent's hand there is a high likelihood he's got an all red hand because of how he's played it. It's going to save me seven damage if I block with it versus if I had blocked with it on this turn, it's only going to save me two or three damage or I got punished because, oh, he searched a blue, you know, he can search a blue with belittle and, yeah. you know, it, it just so many different little things like that, that, that make the difference. Yeah. And this is something I can definitely attest to when I played Raiden Bolton. I can tell when my old opponent is good or not very, very quickly because they'll yep. know when to throw the stalagmite in front of things. The, I yep. like to do a test on turn three to see if he's paying <laughs> attention. This is what I do. I block with two cards. Then I play a take flight charge a card using the tunic for the resource. If they don't throw stalagmite in front of that, I know he's bad because <laughs> stalagmite prevents Raiden from swinging, right? So you basically yep. just blocked yeah. for five. Right, yeah. and that, that I often do that as like a poke, just to see, hey, are you paying attention here, Oldham? <laughs> and if they <laughs> if they're like, all right, yeah, it's all right, take because take flight doesn't have an on hit effect, so often they're like, yeah, all right, I take four. I'm like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> all right, rated for three, and now I know how to cut quarters against you. Um, mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. So that's that's another thing. I, I I really think that ice react is actually one of the more most difficult things, and it is that plus stalagmite makes just makes it very difficult for other people. So just even just having them, you already get the benefit of them. But yep. if you can use them, you can really, really, really get a lot of value out of it. Uh, the, and so, the ice react is single-handedly the hardest thing to do in the deck. 
Yes, by far. Okay. Uh, also, I guess one, one last thing for all of them is you could actually add a whole nother thing right below it that mm-hmm. says playing against Oldham games <laughs> to proficiency level. <laughs> and so, like, you know, playing against the Oldham and what he's capable of doing and structuring your turns in, in a way um, is like is like a whole nother, you know, a whole nother experience. So I think that's a, something that every player needs to be familiar with, no matter what you decide to play. Yeah, because um, sure. that's one that's one of the very few heroes other than Icelander that has a lot of agency on your turn, and you need to know how to uh, how to play around that. Sure. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's talk about Briar now. Another hero from TOA. Uh, I think just like most aggro decks, is fairly easy to pick it up. Yep. You see it first. Yep. yep. When is you, it when is, is it almost identical to Viscera's like chart? or uh yeah. it's uh it's it's a little harder than Visrod at the beginning just because every turn's not as straightforward as you know fitting everything within a blue because you don't use your blues half the time mm-hmm. um however the big difference would be the aha moment f- for Briar would be around like 90%, which would be where you learn that you could actually block an aggro deck and actually time and provide yourself a runway to get to the card that wins you the game, which is heroic. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's the big, you know, because anytime I'm playing a mirror match and I see Rebel and Rune Blood in my opponent's deck, I'm like, okay. They, they've they've built their their deck in a way to where they only have one strategy. Mm-hmm. They're literally building their deck in a way to where they have to play all their cards out, and that's just a worse fi, right? Um, but Briar has the unique ability that she has cards in her deck that are a utility, but she doesn't need them for anything. So once you realize that, and if you look at the other half of her hero ability where it increases the block on her non attacks, um, why would you? you know, not leverage that and block in very efficient ways when you can. I would say that my aha moment like came from you. Um, like uh, you explaining Briar to me and like multiple times and I've, I'd taken Briar and I had gone, you know, hor- done absolutely horrible for like a few weeks with the deck. And then I just turned a corner at one point and was like, all right, I am winning games now. And yeah. I think that the aha moment is literally just doing the math. It's like, yeah. Like, I can't stress, like, if you play Flesh and Blood enough, you know how many games are won at one and two life. Like, mm-hmm. it, it's it's unreal how many games you are like, all right, I blocked for exactly enough, and I have exactly enough to kill my opponent. I played this game perfectly. And Briar is one of those decks where if you do not do that, you will lose. And you will lose by one or two life. And yep. once you start leveraging, like, okay, this Sift is going to block a Snatch for four, like that's when you start to turn the corner and like that seems very intuitive but you also like have to know like the thresholds that like what 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 is what am i losing to right like if i hit bravo and i get an embodiment and then i can block with my grasp of the arc knight and one of my non-attack actions and block six on a spinal crush like Mm -hmm. and i didn't have to use a defense reaction you know like or whatever to to get around that it, there's just so much utility that the hero ability provides, like setting up on your first turn, like the game, and just all kinds of counting your non attacks and your attacks in your graveyard. There is a higher threshold towards the end where it took me 100 games with Briar to even start to get past that, like 80% proficiency. Um, so I, I would. I sure. would definitely agree that it's it's harder in the in the long run. Do you think this should be a little bit higher? And where do you think it should end? I, I think the eighty eighty percent should be a little bit higher, personally. But um, sure, I think it should be more like towards like the eighty, and then ninety should be like one hundred and fifty. <laughs> but like, yeah, I think. Or, mm-hmm. But that's just personally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then the last the last like hundred percent is min maxing high roll potential. Yep, I think that is you know realizing that. You haven't seen a Tome of Harvest yet, and then just making sure that you end a turn with a card in Arsenal, even when it may not be the absolute min-max, you know, mathematical, you know, turn that, that you could make. 
but those small little things just give you the ability to high roll, whereas you normally wouldn't. You would just take one point of damage. Because, you know, high roll has a mathematical value, right? It's, it's a lot harder to calculate it, but you can calculate, you know, a rough, if this happens X percentage of times, you can you can actually extract a value off of that. And I think mm -hmm. that's where a lot of um, the last little bit on Briar mm -hmm. is. And it's, yep. it's, uh, it's pretty difficult. I think Briar utilizes the arsenal better than any deck. In, in the format almost um it it like it, it has so many cards where it's like lightning surge from arsenal need an arsenal for tome of harvest need an arsenal for high high roll potential like right. you need to save an arsenal because you need a certain non-attack and attack like combination you know like so you need to know what you're missing like there's mm -hmm. it just utilizes it better than, than that cardly this is actually something that now that we've talked about this a little bit this is actually kind of like an aha moment for a lot of heroes is you know, get, going from 80 to 90, 90 to 100 is how you utilize your arsenal with each hero has actually evolved over time. As especially, mm -hmm. on, you, I think everybody's kind of felt this that like they used to kind of arsenal any old card or yeah. they, they've act, like, they've never. Uh, one of the important things is to getting the maximum efficiency out of your cards is knowing how to like what to arsenal and how to use it and all that is is very 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 important i used to like put attack generally okay i'll give you an example from dorinthia so in the past i used to like put attack reactions into arsenal now very rarely is that the case um you normally want your threat in the arsenal because there's more yeah. attack reactions in your deck uh you know that's, that's something that i learned you know somewhere around you know 70 to 80 percent uh is that you especially on like turn turn zero turn one right you put your threat into the arsenal you don't put your attack reaction into the arsenal uh with uh, many other decks like you have to know when you need to, w to put a threat there or you need to put something defensive there or whatever that's that's just a huge level up moment in general and briar is one of those heroes that you know that's uh exemplified there all right uh how many games to get to certified briar grandmaster Probably the same as Levia, probably. Like four hundred, four hundred fifty. Yeah, something like that. Not, yeah, maybe just four hundred, maybe. Okay, so that puts her as like medium, right? Right. Yeah. 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 She's definitely not hard. Mm -hmm. Lexi. All right, Lexi. Lexi. Ooh, well, let us hear about it, Will. Lexi is tricky in that she's not that difficult at first. It's easy to read Voltaire and be like, ah, the first arrow is going to have go again. The second arrow is going to have plus one. And you can beat a lot of decks just going, here's an arrow with a hit effect. Here's another arrow. Here's an arrow. Here's another arrow. Um, it's the decks that can make you run out of arrows where you have to very quickly understand mm -hmm. that Lexi is a setup and payoff deck. The setup needs to be good, and the payoff needs to be my opponent's not going to get to play again for the rest of the match, and I'm going to kill him with chip damage. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, I completely agree. Also, I, have, I have played the defensive deck against Lexi before, and some games it feels like, when based on the skill level of your opponent, you'll either win at like 30 life, and they didn't do a dang thing, or you won at 5 life because they drew well, but not in the top 90 percent of their deck because they struggle with that that matchup but they at least had a chance to win <laughs> so right. you can tell the proficiency of your opponent based on that yep knowing uh, how I to think, utilize the arsenal slots is also very important there yep go, go for anything yeah I, th I think like there's really just two phases of lexi i think 50 to 80 is just learning the lines maximum efficiency and everything and then 80 to 100 is beating fatigue and disruption yes I think that's literally just how you break it up. And yep. um, I, I don't think getting to 80 is the hardest thing in the world, but I think getting to, to 100 is, is, is on up there. And one thing I do want to notice that's pretty interesting as we put in these numbers, look at the top section and where those heroes cap out. Yep. And then once we get to Monarch and they introduce the talent system, mm. look at how the decks change in their difficulty. And that's to be expected, right? Because you're operating on the same axis with a class, but you're adding in a whole nother thing to consider, mm -hmm. yep. which which does make sense. So 
Um, once again, just to reiterate the purpose of all this for, for you guys is we want to provide you the information so that if you want to make an investment on a new hero, you know what you're getting into. You know, you might yeah. say, I'm not willing to put in a thousand games, so I'm not going to play one, one game of Kano. We want to save you the, the, the 50 games before you come to that realization because you could already be a fifth of the way there on Bravo, right? And so that's that's what we want to reemphasize that. We probably should have said that a little bit earlier, but you know. No, no, I, I think uh, to add on to what you're saying, the more heroes also, like that, that's also another, like, right? It, it's just right. more things to know. Like yep. a hero like Bravo, like you said, it, operates on what its opponent can do, right? Like it probably gained a few games to get to mastery yeah. just by the addition of another set. Mm -hmm. So, right. like, yeah. And any hero that has that is doing multiple styles as soon as you start adding in heroes like it just becomes a a nightmare yeah. an exponential nightmare uh does this does this look roughly correct the numbers here yeah yeah, yeah like right. all right so that puts her in the medium medium hard or medium? medium yeah okay sure all right let's talk about the uprising heroes we got three of them here let's start off with icelander um Wow, I, I guess I guess to start, are we talking traditional Icelander or attack it, action Icelander? It's, it, it's both. I think both. we have to say okay. like because the ability for this deck to play both is also right. part of its proficiency, right? Yeah. right. Um, and in I, my opinion, yeah, I don't think she's that hard. But this is coming from the outside looking in. But she doesn't seem that hard. Maybe maybe you're just a genius. Yeah, <laughs> she, she, she's definitely not. She's Kano definitely level. not as hard as Kano, right? Yeah. She's not at that level. Yeah. But I mean, I've played probably fifteen games of limited with her, so I'm basically an expert. So I can confidently say, no, <laughs> no I, I could say that um, she's not like very hard to pick up and go. Mm -hmm. But it it can be very difficult because just the the fact of playing on both turns you have you have to calculate okay I want to block this but I also want to do this on your turn but then I need to pitch Cornet Peak to keep my channel like frigid around so you're thinking in three steps you're thinking on yeah. your turn what that makes them do, then they're clapping back and you're like, okay, I want to hit you and block. And then you want to say, okay, what do I have left on my turn? And that's that, that can also lead to that. Whose turn is it moment? You know, <laughs> maybe she bumps up to a hundred percent on 80, just or a hundred matches. I mean, just yeah. it, you're right. There's, there's some trickiness to be had there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also, I also think something that adds to her difficulty. Um, so in most, in most decks, when you look at a hand of cards, right? Um, like you're talking about, like we'll just take, take a couple examples. Viscera, you need a blue, the non-attack, the attack, get into the sword swing, right? So like you can do that math pretty easily. I'm gonna pitch my blue. I'm gonna play my non-attack. I'm gonna play my mm -hmm. attack. I'm a sword swing. There's not much to think about. With Icelander, even e I mean, even with Bolton, right? Like you've got light cards, you've got attack action cards, you've got your reactions, you've got your you know these sorts of things. You need a light card to charge for whatever. Or you need a light there's just little things you have to think about, like what's in my soul, what am I pitching, you know, like the little things like that. Whereas Icelander takes it a step further, and it's like, okay, I've got arcane damage, I've got physical damage, I've got ice cards I need to keep for certain things. I need also do I need to save resources for my waning moon? Am I waning mooning this turn? I can do that on my opponent's turn and it's three damage. I could do it on my turn and it's two damage. Am I blocking this turn? Because if I block, then I lose the ice card that I'm going to be fusing with for my other card. Uh, there's just a lot of like little like your hand becomes a whole lot more complicated with Icelander in terms of its value and like blocking with a certain card, you lose a certain value. If I, uh, you know, or like you got to keep your life total around if you're going to be fighting spirit, gain a life, you know, like th these types of things. But I think Icelander's complicatedness on terms of like raw hand value and like looking at like a hand of its cards versus any other deck is much higher. So I would put like its early like proficiency a little bit higher just sure. because it's going to be a little bit harder just to real like understand what you can do with a hand of Icelander at yep. the at like trying to get towards that max level proficiency. Okay. Okay. And you have to know what to do when your opponent plays Rusted Relic. 
Like, I mean, you, you have to have a plan, right? No. Yeah. And in all seriousness, you have to know what to do when your opponent flips over AB4 or AB5, right, right. you exactly. know, like... Or so. no AB, and they're trying to cancel out your attacks. With exactly. The armor. Like, it, it, there's, exactly. There's a lot. Yep. Um, this hero came out recently, but... So I, I don't know how many people in the world are or at 900 but uh <laughs> what would you say was would be the aha moment for icelander or um how when you're playing against an icelander you know that they're good when they adjust their game plan mm -hmm. yeah there's a certain moment where i feel like i can see them figuring out how they're gonna finish it right and if i, I, I don't usually... see that happening i feel like i'm fine mm -hmm. yeah I, I usually watch their pitch stack very closely um, to try to figure out if they're a good player or not. Um, if, if I'm blocking a lot of Arcane uh, and they pitch a Frost Hex to the very bottom of their deck, um, where like I can just kind of I can I know that I can fatigue them, and they don't like and I don't have any Frost Hexes on the board right now. Like if if they're if they're pitching their like I'm not worried about the Frost Hex in 20 turns. I'm worried about it being there for 20 turns. Right. Um, and, and so like, if I see like all the ice eternals go into the bottom, like that's, that's problem, you know, like they're not blocking with the ice eternals, like, um, like it, it, watching them adjust how, how they pitch and what they're, what they're playing mm -hmm. as you, you know, give them a game plan to work with. Like, that's how you can kind of figure out if they're, they're paying attention. Sure. I would say it's easily the, the hardest on this graph, um, so far to yeah. finish at a hundred percent. Yeah. It's probably like six. 300 and then maybe like and then like 800 yeah that's where i would put it because it's yeah. not like we said it's not a kano but it operates in that same spectrum of playing on both turns consistently yeah. it also operates with less help yeah that's right so this is considered a hard or very hard hero i would say very hard okay all right let's talk about phi you can get to 100 and 100 games next okay. <laughs> is, is, this the, is this the quickest hero to learn? Yes. Yeah, yes, I think it is. so. He's pretty easy. I, I would say your aha moments happened really around like the ninety percent. Like, like there's only a few of them, and they're yeah. like, it's like okay. Like for me, one of the aha moments with the deck when I first started like playing it and watching other people play it was like okay, uh, my on hit effect from mounting anger. You know, when it hits. In response to the trigger, get my Phoenix Flame back so that I like when I have no cards left in hand, you know, so that I can banish it to give it like the plus one or whatever. And like that, those very small little things is yep. you know, it's a, it's a yep. stretch to find those moments. But yeah, yep. I, I learned that spreading flames applies to the weapon in limited. <laughs> so now I know that. So I have that level up moment for Fi and CC if I ever play them. Yeah, yeah. Just, a, just a shout out real quick. I'm going to let you guys in on a little secret. If you want to skip okay. the first 30 games in limited, especially, and you want to start playing Fi 80%, go listen to the Attack for 20 podcast. Those guys over there know exactly what they're talking about, and they will get you, um, they'll get you going on a quick note, especially in limited. Great guys over there. Sure, absolutely. Okay, um, so the the aha moment for Fi is just running into those niche things once. Maximizing damage on on turns, just uh, you could almost goldfish the turn and try to figure out like, oh, did I miss a point of damage here or there? You know, yeah, and sure. Yeah. I think the it's just it revolves around like when you want what attack you want mass trigger to land on, yeah, and then also knowing when to break the chain when you have more than one Phoenix Flame to get an extra point or two of damage out. Mm -hmm. That's just in like limited too, really. I've never done. Yeah, that. limited so and I mean, and and constructed. E Less e -pots, is a, e e pots is another thing that has yep. added just a slight difficulty increase to the deck. Knowing knowing those, uh, I guess the ch the aha moment is also like understanding like yes, he's an aggro deck, but you also still have to block correctly <laughs> in some matchups. Right, and, but he's not hard. He's you have not. to block when you have to. <laughs> he's, his, his stuff is intuitive. Once you know, like, yeah. I can grab a Phoenix Flame and use it to satisfy E Strike. It's like, that's yeah. not that hard. <laughs> yeah. You're at 70% when you don't forget to put a Phoenix Flame in this 
the graveyard at the beginning of the game. <laughs> Before the start of the That's seventy <laughs> percent. That's the then hardest gotta, part of playing five. Yeah, then you got to work for the rest of it. Yeah. <laughs> I also win in the dice roll in the high. Yeah, that's that, that uh, also helps. Yep. Yeah. All right, last hero here is Dromai. That's give all us, Willie B. Give, give us the breakdown, Will. Dromai is. Uh, <laughs> 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 Dromai is not that hard. Until you run into a guardian that knows what they're doing, and you have to play so perfectly, and it's so frustrating, and it's <laughs> not easy. Droma is such an uphill battle, um, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about getting the proficiency with the deck. How many matches does it take? Um, to understand how to produce ash and how to make dragons and figure out what dragons are actually worth blocking and what dragons are worth keeping to play, you're probably there in like 15 matches i think um to start us off and then we can go up to like uh, what do you think from there like 30 because it, it isn't easy like it's it's very easy to play into ninja's hands and just like or into dory like oh my gosh if you just barf out dragons she'll just build a dawn blade but she'll never get around so i think she's a little tricky actually i, I would argue the same i would say that yeah. she is she is one of the harder heroes to learn proficiency wise mm -hmm. e easy to get going but very difficult to yep. <laughs> I, yeah. I think a lot of people get get into the trap of mm. <laughs> ooh a dragon <laughs> 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 i can't block with this this is a dragon <laughs> and so you know it's like well they, it's a block three <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, and then the, the 90 percent is like just really knowing how to what would you say is the aha moment for for your for leveling up as as Dromai? What is that something uh, that you learn in the fires of battle? Counting uh, their poppers and uh, trying to be able to read that they uh, so many times I could literally read on the olden player's face like you didn't draw a popper this hand and I would just swing with my dragons even though if he had a popper it would ruin my whole plan late mm -hmm. game but he'd take he'd like he'd be ruined because he didn't draw a popper so it's just counting what they're blocking with uh figuring out like what are you pitching to get to that late game because some of those matches feel impossible and then also like there's not a ton you can do against like Fi. you better hope they're bad because you're not yeah. gonna beat Fi. <laughs> For, for for somebody like you, the, the I think the proficiency came a lot faster because you were a Prism player before, and I think that's why a lot of people that played Prism gravitated towards it because the ability to read poppers and like actually play your turn when when you know your opponent has a popper, just very okay. similar to how Josh can play a Bolton hand when he knows his opponent plays Blizzard or a Stalagmite or something like that. The Illusionist has to play when he knows that his opponent has a six block in hand. So like I'm gonna attack with my sweeping blow first. I'm gonna play a mirror guy. I'm gonna attack with the mirror guy with no phantasm. I'm gonna you know like you can you can structure your turns in a way to maximize the amount of damage you can do and punish them for holding that six block in yep. hand to wait for the card to pop. You yep, could even yep, yep. you could even just e strike them at the end of the turn when they you mm -hmm. knew they were waiting for the you or know dust up Oof, yeah, yeah or dust just ups. do some <laughs> yeah dust ups great too. Um, but that that's like kind of the aha moments I think mm -hmm. is like okay, maximizing that damage and like oh he's holding the popper I'll just do this <laughs> you mm -hmm. know and punish them really. I think yeah. mastery is tricky because I don't even think anybody's mastered her yet. Um, I'd say like five hundred, six hundred, something like that. Yeah, I would yeah. agree. I would probably put like six hundred just to put it above a deck like Lexi. Mm. <laughs> I would put her at the hard. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I do want to change Durante to medium since okay. we haven't had any yeah. in betweens. Okay, so five one out of five. Reinhardt Bravo, Ketsu Azalea, two out of five. Dory Dash Viserai. Briar Lexi, three out of five. Bolton. Leviah, Oldham, Dromai, 4 out of 5. Icelander, Kano, 5 out of 5. What do you know? The wizards are the hardest to learn. <laughs> yeah. And the ninjas are the easiest. <laughs> All right. So let's, uh, let's see if I can set this up here. Okay, so we now have all of our games. Let's I guess put this over here. Okay, so is there any... Like anything that you guys want to talk about now that we've kind of uh, finished all of the uh, all of the graphs? Is there any any uh, anything you want to talk about? 
I think we could just add on to what Nathan had kind of interjected, you know, towards the end there is like what, what to get out of this really. Like, I think that's like what, you know, try to try to help people figure out why we made this chart. It may look like a lot of numbers, a lot of complicated, like, you know, a lot of lines and stuff. And like, but when you break it down, you really just want to look at it and be like, all right, are there heroes that I want to learn? Mm -hmm. What am I willing to invest to learn a hero? And what am I willing to, what do I want to get out of learning that hero? Do I want to be like the best player, like, or do I want to win the most matches? Or do I just want to gain proficiency with a hero or, you know, like, okay, I, I want to learn Bravo. That's not going to be, that's not going to take too many games. I can spend, you know, a few weeks learning Bravo and I can probably be, you know, at 70, 80% with Bravo, which is where, where I want to be. Um, I don't want to be at 100% with Bravo. And you can do that really easily. Whereas a hero like Kano or a hero like, you know, Icelander or, or, or Dromai or something like that, it's going to be, it's going to require, you know, maybe two months of, of playing instead of a month to get to that like 70, 80 proficiency. So just knowing, trying to help people realize what they want to get out of a hero and helping them make a decision. Yep. Um, in general, we're, uh, I think something that we mentioned earlier, but I just want to rehash it is that the WTR and ARC heroes are, were built to be much more straightforward. This is, you know, mm -hmm. 2,900 games to get there. This is like 3,950 to get to mastery on these. Um, I think in general, we're just going to see heroes get, more and more complicated uh, as as time goes. Um, Every card yeah. game is good, kind of follows that same trajectory, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, another thing that I, I would like to point out is my favorite thing about Flesh and Blood is look at the numbers from 50 to 80%. And then look at the numbers from 80 to 100. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what that shows is great design from the company. It shows. It doesn't take a lot for most of these heroes to start picking it up and playing it, but to truly play it to its best ability, it's going to take some reps for most of the heroes, right? Um, so, you know, it's it's good to have a game like that. Um, you you won't obviously want harder heroes. You want easier heroes, so that way everybody has access to what they what they prefer. But they did a great job. This is why the, the Blitz decks, the Doi versus Reinhardt decks are very good introductions. Um, mm -hmm. You know, pick, picking up a lot of the heroes at a base level does not take too, too long. Mm. But there's a lot of depth in a lot of the heroes. And a lot of it comes down to matchup spread. And, you know, how, how often you're going to have to adjust to things. Whether or not you have to play offense and defense. How complicated is it to set up a big turn? Um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of factors here, and I hope you guys, uh, you know, got something out of this. Um, uh, anything else, or you can just wrap this up and get going. I feel good about this one. I like it. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I, I think I think the idea for this chart uh, mm -hmm. with you and you and Nathan talking about, you know, coming up with something like this, I think it was a good idea. Mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of people have really thought about. You know, like how, to, like how, how long is it really going to take me to be proficient with mm -hmm. with a certain deck? Right. Um, and maybe people can look at this as well and be like, okay, well, I've I've played fifty games with Bravo. Does it look correct? You know, like do you mm -hmm. do you feel that? like 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 we did a good job? And you know, leave that in the comments below. Like you know, if 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 you feel like you know we were wrong on one of these topics, and you feel like you know one of the heroes is just completely off kilter, and you want to you know repute it, we're we're always we're always willing to listen to that sort of stuff because we are not always correct and you know this is coming from a small a small group of people um right. coming up with these numbers so mm -hmm. i think i you know and, and obviously there's different levels of genius you know as well so like some people can <laughs> some people can read a book and get everything out of it the first time they read it and other yep. people need to read it three times so mm -hmm. um I, I feel like there's a lot to be said for for what you know what nathan said about how how good they made these heroes and how, how good flesh and blood did so, now yeah. going back to your pokemon uh part at the start it's funny to me that katsu who's like a wind ninja he's our pidgeotto of the lot and dromai <laughs> is our uh, magikarp into gyarados of the lot she's a dragon yeah. like yeah, you know, there you perfect go. there you go Perfectly, like we, we planned it. <laughs> <laughs> we really didn't. <laughs> we, we didn't. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> that be the Rick, thumbnail, just Rick. Katsu with a Pidgeotto face and Jeremiah uh, with a Gyarados face. <laughs> flesh and blood meets Pokemon. <laughs> we, we we didn't do anything on Control Fire. We we, we must. Uh, have uh, no, I need it. Oh, oh no, I need it. No, no, I've been no, staring no, at that no, for no. so long. We'll save that. We'll <laughs> save that for uh, for another video. I, I I forgot to have another sheet down here. Uh oh. Uh. <laughs> or did I? <laughs> or did I? It's our hidden worlds list. <laughs> <laughs> can we show um, that off yep. well, all right uh why don't you wrap us up alex let's get out of here sure sure thanks everybody for watching like subscribe all that fun stuff really really check us out join the discord we have so many fun people in there to talk to and we're always in there hanging out so it's always a good time uh all those links are down in the description if you ever buy cards off tcg player we've also got an affiliate link in the description if you're looking to pick up any cards picking up a deck whatever you know, just all it takes nothing just to throw our uh, affiliate link before you buy the cards and we get a little kickback from it. So we appreciate every little bit and thanks so much for watching. Thanks everybody for joining in on the call here and uh, we'll see you guys in the next video. All right. Bye bye. Roll Tide. Yep. Thank goodness that wasn't in the recording. <laughs> that, that, that is in the recording, but it's, uh, yeah. I'm going to edit that out, I guess. <laughs> Damn it. All right. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh...